Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Greg Masters, and I'm the managing editor of SC Magazine. Welcome to another session in our e-conference on auditing and compliance, Simple Tips for Better Security and Sustainable Compliance, brought to you by NetIQ. In the last seven years, more than 562 million records have been breached in the United States. Despite laws with strict fines that have been put in place and increasing awareness about brand damage from such exposures, the personal information of customers and clients continues to be exposed. A laptop is stolen, an insider out for a quick profit abuses his privilege to transfer corporate data to an underground market, a backup tape being transferred by a third party mysteriously disappears, you get the picture. But there are steps that can be put in place that will help mitigate risk. Here to discuss this and to provide suggestions is Michael Colson, the Senior Product Manager for Security Products at NetIQ. Michael has more than 21 years of experience in engineering and management positions with aerospace, medical, and IT security companies. At NetIQ, he develops solutions that manage security and compliance for customers worldwide. We will have an opportunity after Michael's presentation for a Q&A, so we encourage you to submit any questions for Michael via the interface at any time. So with that, let me welcome Michael. Nice to have you with us today. Thank you, Greg, for that introduction, and thank you all for joining today. Now, I always enjoy the opportunity to talk about how you can be compliant and then how you can be more efficient at achieve, achieving that compliance. So Greg talked a little bit about the condition. I want to talk a little bit about why you care. <clears throat> it's in the headlines every day. It, it seems it's all the rage. The breaches are making headlines. Hacktivism was on the rise in 2011, and 2011 was called the year of hacktivism, projecting a seemingly hopeless condition for corporations and fame notoriety for the hackers. It appears that all they need to do is target you, and they're in. This is supported by the latest Verizon 2012 investigations report, where it reported that hacking was linked to almost all compromised records. As an enabling factor, vulnerabilities continue to dot the threat scape. Misconfigurations of systems continue to exist despite all of the best practices published over the last decade. And let's not forget about the ever-present human error. You all know too well the persistence of vulnerabilities and error, but let's take a moment to discuss misconfigurations. The most basic configuration component involving access to critical systems is the password. All the encryption in the world will not help you if someone has your password. Verizon reported in their 2011 breach report that exploits involving default or common passwords was represented in two-thirds of all intrusions and one-third of all compromised records. It's pretty amazing. And as you know, the external threat environment has become much more dangerous. Today's attacks are stealthy and target specific companies, individuals, and data. A typical targeted attack will exploit multiple weaknesses to achieve the ultimate goal, usually to steal data or compromise a specific account. So organizations need to present a hard target to an attacker. This requires a combination of network protection and vulnerability management processes to find and fix security weaknesses in systems and applications, as well as the implementation of shielding technologies to protect systems and applications that will have long-standing vulnerabilities. Unfortunately, perfect defenses are not achievable, and better detection is also needed. And we know a vulnerability management program focused only on vulnerability assessment is weak in a crucial vulnerability management program objective. So making the environment more secure is important. A large percentage of vulnerabilities result from configuration issues, as I mentioned earlier. So let's take a look at by the numbers, and Greg mentioned some of these earlier, but six years, 900 million records, a lot of money spent in, uh, in investigating, reporting, and solving these issues. And the data keeps coming in from other, from privacyrights.org. In 2011, 535 breaches involving 30.4 million sensitive records. This year, Information Week reported that 419 data breaches were publicly disclosed in 2011 in the U.S., 
for a total of 22.9 million records exposed. Based on Identity Theft Resource Center um, and Privacy Rights Clearinghouse, it's a larger number. As we said, 535 breaches, including the notorious Sony PlayStation incident. In 2012, Verizon reported 855 incidents, 174 million compromised records. So I won't bore you with more numbers, but it's, it's large. So what happens when that, when that is the case, when your data is out there, when your data is exposed? Well, people get angry and lawmakers get to work. So the environment right now is very ripe for legislation and there are a lot of um, activities in process right now. And it's global. Over 40 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands have active legislation requiring the notification of, breach, of data breaches involving personal information. So, and now we're starting to see even greater financial penalties on the horizon. So let's take a few, few examples. So last year, the pioneer of data breach notification laws, California, updated its data breach law. SB 24, which took effect this year, requires organizations to provide details on steps that customers should take to protect themselves, as well as mandates notification to the state's attorney general's office if the breach affected as little as 500 people. This makes it tough for organizations to hide small incidents. And in Texas, House Bill 300 expanded on the definition of covered entities as any entity that engages in, processes, obtains, or stores protected health information. This law goes into effect in September, and failure to meet the requirements can result in financial penalties and felony charges. While the California law applies to residents only, the Texas law applies not only to residents, but to any individual whose data has been compromised by a breach, requiring notification to residents in states that have not yet enacted laws. The amended law also increases the penalties for failure to notify customers. It goes from a maximum of 50,000 to 100 per individual per day of failed delayed notification, not to exceed 250,000 for a single breach. In January of this year, many of you probably read that Europe proposed strict new data privacy rules to protect users' information. The European Data Protection Directive will impact any company operating in Europe, extending the reach to companies based in the U.S. that hold information on European customers. These proposals are expected to come, become law at the end of 2013, and the breach rules have significant fines of up to 2% of companies' annual revenue. There's a lot of object objections to this um, data protection directive, and we'll see what happens in the end, but let's all just know that, that um, the lawmakers are at work, and the lawmakers are going to make it very expensive for us not to protect our data. So these are just a few examples. The penalties are not going away and will get tougher. In the end, much like high-tech high -tech did for HIPAA, any new laws will help strengthen compliance and provide more teeth. The focus is on building trust for the adoption of technology advances and not on simply taking steps to meet regulation requirements. And if that wasn't enough, let's think about the damage to your business, the, the, the people that don't want to address your campaigns anymore, um, the people that uh, – you, the customers you lose, the damage to your brand, the, the money you spend on uh, the lawsuits. You know, just a simple basic loss of personal information consisting of email, name, and address is enough to fuel a social engineering attack or attempt to open a line of credit. So customers will pull away from your online campaigns or completely away from your business if they know that they can't trust you with their data. So let's look at some examples. The recent global, payment, global payments uh, problem. Just and, uh, and and that fallout is yet to settle. Just a few months back, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee agreed to pay 1.5 million to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to settle HIPAA violations, and that's related to a data breach that occurred in 2009. And this is on top of the 17 million spent on activities associated with the breach. And this settlement is the first resulting from enforcement action taken by the HHS under high tech high-tech breach notification requirements. 
And recently in the news, LinkedIn has been hit with a potential class action lawsuit alleging it failed to meet industry standard security practices in connection with a massive data breach earlier this month. So give some thought to the industry standard security practices for a moment. It is more than compliance. So as you can see, compliance can pack a powerful punch. It needs to be taken more seriously than a point-in-time audit. A process must be put in place to continuously assess security state, minimizing compliance for compliance sake, and ensure that compliance initiatives improve security and reduce risk. Technology is a key to this. So need more evidence? We have more evidence. And the, and the mandatory nature of regulatory compliance combined with specific and and quantifiable penalties for noncompliance has directed a large portion of overall security spending in corporations toward compliance efforts on the premise that this will improve security and reduce breach risk. When security product, projects are focused slowly, I mean solely on, on meeting a minimal set of audit criteria rather than minimizing risk, much of that potential of that security funding is wasted. Allowing the a credit and forget it approach to drive security priorities is kind of like cramming for an exam. You may pass the exam or the audit, but you are unlikely to retain any of the benefits that would have been gained from careful study and planning. Passing an audit for PCI DSS, for example, is a good achievement, but even PCI DSS is considered, you know, one of the most prescriptive mandates, is still only a minimum standard and does not guarantee protection. Case in point, both the Heartland Payment Systems and TJ Maxx had achieved or were achieving PCI compliance when they were breached. So let's look at some of the tips. Let's consider the process. Audit shouldn't be your Super Bowl. I'm sure some of you have been in this very position. The audit's coming up. You pull together a top-notch team, prepare for the audit materials. The audit happens, and you exit the process with tears in your beard or proudly waving a foam finger in the air. While that can be an exciting process, emotionally charged, it took significant time to freshly prepare for that audit and react to the results. In today's complex regulatory environment, many organizations struggle to integrate regulatory compliance programs with their day-to-day -day security operations. So this can lead to audit findings and data breaches that result in, in very expensive mitigation and fines and penalties, as, as we've seen earlier. So what if it were a more natural process, maybe more like a doctor's visit? So maintaining compliance through implementation of a security program is relative to maintaining your health and having regular well visits with your doctor. It does not produce the desired result to exercise and eat right a month or two before your checkup. Relative to maintaining good health, consider the case of dieting. Organizations that pursue compliance for the sake of compliance are similar to people who go on crash diets. They may benefit in the short term, but will probably not have improved health or made genuine commitment to a healthier lifestyle. And the weight loss is likely to to not be sustainable in the long term. Likewise, sustainable compliance is best achieved by focusing on improvements to the overall security posture of the organization and not that point in time audit. So let's think about a plan. Be proactive. Intruders are going to continue to use creative methods for gaining access to your network. Take a proactive step in your IT security posture by developing a plan with a goal to strengthen security. I'm going to repeat that throughout this presentation as it's, it's a very key point to take, take with you. You need to strengthen your security, shorten that reaction time when that threatening event occurs, and it will occur. Uh, implementing a technology solution, as I mentioned earlier, can help reduce the panic, minimize the surprise, and pr improve the reaction time but you need to sell it to the business based on the value to the business. So how do you gain support for that plan? And of course, I, know, I want to note, you still need a reactive plan, but that is now based on information coming from a proactive, continuous process. So the language of leadership. So remember the 
newspaper image at the beginning of this presentation. Another goal of a strong IT security program is to keep your C-suite out of the news. The C-suite has a fiduciary responsibility to protect the assets of the company and minimize loss. The C-suite strives to harness the power of innovation and create new value and efficiencies to grow the business. That's their job. In order to achieve these objectives, they become the risk managers and concern themselves with all manners of risk, not just those associated with cybercrime. As we have seen, when the breach happens, they will be held legally accountable for the measure they put in place to protect the company. So security professionals must align security goals with the highest party of the organizations. We see the CISO invited more and more to the boardroom, and they need to help the C-suite understand how information security risk fits within their macro-level risk management activities and help them understand what must be done rather than what should be done. So let's start with the basics. The sad fact is many compliance efforts tend to focus so solely on meeting audit criteria rather than minimizing that risk we, talk, we were talking about. What we are learning from customers and the industry is that there is an increasing trend in focusing on security as a core objective and compliance, core objective to compliance, as well as gaining alignment between business operations and security groups. So compliance is being seen more and more as a byproduct of good security and much of the focus is turning toward developing risk program in line with business objectives. So you need to align with the business as we discussed. You want to make the risk mitigation part of all new projects. So when you start a project in IT, you look at where is that data going to be stored, how is that data going to be accessed, who needs access to it, and make that part of the process. Currently, what is most often done is it's an afterthought. Don't make it an afterthought. So you need to make the case. So we've talked about the fact that you need to align the needs with the business, the risks with the business, and you need to make the case to, to put your program in place. So you can't counter threat, but you can definitely mitigate it. You can, you can, um, you can put systems in place to handle insider threat. You can handle misconfigured, misconfigured systems, malware hacking. So think of it as, you know, hurricanes or floods. You can, you can get insurance to to help you in the event of a catastrophic event, and you usually do it based on your own risk appetite and what you're able to handle, the deductible you choose, uh, uh, you know, what you want to insure. And the security expenditures, likewise, should be justified by a reasonable reduction in that risk as well. And it's difficult um, for technical organizations to make the case for budget to fund security initiatives. You can't expect a CEO to stay awake while you're explaining the importance of compliance and cost. You need to speak in terms of investment to the business as we've discussed. Use the cost of a breach's input to an investment decision on how much to spend to transfer that risk. So let's sum up some of these recommendations in this tip. You need to communicate the need. You need to strike the right balance. You need to proactively work with the business. You need to make security part of every investment, not add it on after the fact. And you need to ensure your investments improve security. If you don't, you could see that funding disappear, and that will be because it's compliance for compliance sake and not for security. So we've touched on this briefly. Let's talk about a continuous process.
good security leads to compliance. As I said before, I'm going to say that many times throughout this presentation. A successful continuous compliance lifecycle defines the operational processes, the technologies that are needed to discover and remediate security weaknesses before they can be exploited. Policies that define a secure IT infrastructure are used as the reference for a baseline to discover vulnerabilities and security configuration policy compliance issues. So security weaknesses need to be assessed with respect to the vulnerability, current threat environment, and business risk of the asset that is affected and prioritize the shielding and remediation of those tasks. There's uh, more and we're, we see more and more talk in the industry about this prioritization, about assigning these risks, about putting together an effective risk program. Uh, many risk programs fail because there's, you just can't gain agreement um, between all the stakeholders. And there's a lot of work going on and a lot of um, resources out there now pointing to how to set up a an effective risk program, as I'm sure you've heard in talks in other talks today. So the remediation is is handled based on that risk because you you're going to find a lot of things in your evaluation, and you're going to need to prioritize based on risk how you're going to remediate those vulnerabilities. So the life cycle implements many basic security controls that auditors seek when evaluating compliance. And organizations that take the extra step of mapping the policies implemented by vulnerability management to control standards and best practices can strengthen their posture with auditors and reduce compliance reporting costs through automation. So what we see is one of the one of the important areas of activity is a common set of controls. And we hear from organizations that have multiple and competing industry standards and mandates that they often have limited resources to address those problem areas. And they struggle to meet the requirements of these standards and mandates. They wonder where to start. What mandate should I focus on first? The, the, the fact of the matter is many of the controls apply across those mandates, across those regulations, across those standards. So the foundation of a sustainable security and compliance program is a common business-aligned framework that addresses the complete set of industry regulation mandates while achieving the underlying security exposures. So we believe the best way to achieve and sustain compliance with regulations is to implement and manage a harmonized set of controls that meet your evolving needs. Leveraging a common set of controls simplifies the audit, provides the framework for our auditing based on how the controls map to a given mandate. And as the regulatory environment evolves, it's very simple to add additional controls to that common set, and the organization can then more quickly realize that in their compliance programming. So streamlining through the harmonizing of controls across regulations and mandates will help you further drive down the cost of compliance. Crucial to reducing the cost of compliance and avoiding annually annual or quarterly audit panic is the automation of routine, very labor-intensive tasks. Automation helps you ensure a reliable, repeatable process and strict adherence to a policy. Some examples of tasks that are appropriate for automation include data collection and evaluation and monitoring and enforcement of technical and manual controls. Automation can also be leveraged to, to in the capture and utilization of embedded corporate and best practice knowledge. So that will free up your skilled staff for more important tasks by freeing overburdened resources, and we hear more and more from companies that either even if they have very large departments to handle compliance and security, they're not growing any further. Or we hear from companies 
uh, large companies that have departments that are shrinking. So you need to put in automation to free up that staff. And by freeing up these resources, you're going to also reduce the human error and and decrease the training costs for new employees. So a new employee comes on, a lot of that foundation has been put in place and is ready to go. So here's the goal. You want greater enterprise security intelligence. So given your critical assets spread across your physical, virtual, and cloud infrastructures, along with the influences on those resources, you can benefit from automation of the technology that will increase your level of security intelligence in your organization, which will also satisfy your compliance needs. Enterprise security intelligence is emerging as a comprehensive, holistic alternative to traditional disjointed security approaches that we have today. This will enable a stronger security model enterprise-wide, optimal decision-making, and result in better business results and decisions. It's about information integration that will add context to that security event and help identify good behavior from bad behavior, along with knowing you have rock-solid configurations in place to help stop or thwart bad behavior. So what are the benefits? So consider the business objectives, risk and cost. Focus on securing the critical assets. Knowing that keeping the bad guys away from your assets is a constant battle, modeling what can happen. For example, when malware lands on a user's desktop, what critical assets could possibly be impacted by that act? Ask yourself how bring your own device and mobile devices can impact that model. Gain awareness of what is happening in your environment. Ensure that you have an automated process in place to continually monitor configurations for the most basic security practices at a minimum. Don't make it easier for the bad guys to gain access once they have penetrated your walls. And monitor behavior on your network. Good and bad behavior is determined based on context. Compliance is a byproduct. You want to choose products that enable information integration interaction and can provide you the context you need to make your decisions. So let's take a look at a case study. Okay. We have several customers that fit this profile and I'll share this one with you. This is a very typical case for a large global company. They have a requirement to comply with multiple global mandates and want to continuously measure compliance. They have, as we've discussed, they have limited staff and they need to automate. So they need to reduce the effort. They have a very complex IT environment. So they need a way to collect and roll up information across their global heterogeneous environment. And they need expertise to help them accomplish their goals. Prepackaged knowledge allowed them to quickly realize results. So we put the security basics in place. We implemented their cross-platform and application support worked with them to develop templates based on out-of-the-box knowledge, provided partnership on the technology and that knowledge. The service and support was there to help them. And we continually provided them additional content, content and best practice knowledge as we learn it. So let's wrap it up. Good security makes compliance easier. So as I've talked about in this presentation today, compliance shouldn't be hard, but security is definitely not easy. But together, you can satisfy both. So what we know today is that data security is 
a critical or high priority for 90% of organizations. Organizations are continually concerned about the evolving nature of threats, as we've seen in the news, from the inside and the outside. They wonder where their critical data resides, who's accessing it, and is it being changed in any way. They're concerned about the damaging effects of a data breach on their organization, both in the short term with fines, mandated disclosure laws, and in the long term with loss of brand, competitiveness, competitiveness, consumer confidence, leading to lost revenues and profitability. And their concerns are warranted, as we discussed earlier in the, in the data of the numbers of breaches that have occurred. And while compliance mandates are designed to provide a minimum standard of security controls to protect your data, compliance itself, as we've seen, will not safeguard you from these damaging breaches. We've learned it time and time again. Only an integrated, automated approach to compliance that's rooted in sound security principles is effective, can be sustained, and can be scaled to meet your growing business needs. This type of approach can help your organization realize positive, long-term business impact in terms of reduced breach risk, avoidance of penalties associated with noncompliance, and, of course, operational efficiencies, and improved security posture. This concludes our presentation today, and I appreciate your attention, and I hope that you're going to take away some of these key tips take it back to your organization and share it with your teams and coworkers and develop your security strategy today. Please learn more about our products in our virtual booth. Back to you, Greg. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions from the audience, uh, and then following that, um, everybody out in the audience can make their way over to the Net IQ booth where reps are on hand to answer any further questions. So, Michael, if you're ready, we have a few questions that have already come in. I like the idea of enterprise security intelligence, but my IT budget is limited. What are the minimum security tools to put in place? Well, let's talk about the fact that um, a lot of breaches could have been circumvented with just simple controls. But we talked about the fact that, you know, basic configuration items like uh, password strength, we see these best practices being ignored. So as we discussed, you have to, to look at your budget, weigh your risks, and start with some fundamentals. Put those fundamentals in place and then grow that over time as you get the buy-in from the business and the budget to implement new controls. Okay. Um, here's another one for you, Michael. Do I really need to put complex tools in place to protect my data from attackers? How can I make the process more pain-free or seamless? So I think, I think here we need to talk more about um, – reducing the complexity of the problem. And putting the tools in place helps you, re and, and the automation helps you reduce that complexity and put the foundation in place that, that can grow to meet your security needs for your, your ever-changing environment as well as the changing threat environment. So that ideal solution is going to be comprehensive. It's going to be automated and it's going to provide you additional context. Okay, very good. Um, besides passwords, what are the three top uh, concerns, mistakes, underlying compliance shortcomings? So, so configuration, security configurations are, is, I would add to that list along with passwords. So we know that Basic security configuration, hardening of a machine, um, maintaining that machine state, 
um, as as that machine lives on the network, we all know that that state can drift. So along with your, you know, domain security policies, password policies, you have that machine state that you need to monitor. You need to look at your critical files, what critical files are being accessed, what configuration changes are being made, what are those changes authorized. There's a myriad of ways that you can grow from, you know, securing the basic password to uh, securing your environment through implementation of uh, configuration management products, SIM, and change auditing products. Okay. Uh, Michael, we know there are uh, bills making their way through both the House and the Senate at this moment trying to unify some of the data breach laws that each individual state or most of the states have in place. And you spoke in your case study about global regulations. Each country has its own data laws. So what are the prospects for a federal data breach law in the United States? Will that make it easier for businesses doing um, operating in the U.S.? I can't um, I can't imagine it making it easier. Um, I think that you know the the my, my opinion is is that as long as we're not taking care of it um, as a company, that the these breach laws, these compliance mandates are going to continue to come. To strengthen, to, to, to force us to strengthen our own security. So I, I think that you know it would help set the expectation. But just like you know, compliance does not d- does not mean security. Well, a, more federal laws are not going to mean security either. That makes sense to me. Okay, and with that, Michael, we're going to have to wrap it up for this session. So let me thank uh, NetIQ's Michael Colson for sharing his recommendations today. And, of course, thanks to all of you for tuning in. If we didn't get to your question in this session, um, you can uh, ask NetIQ reps in their uh, booth in our virtual expo hall. And this entire session will be available on demand beginning tomorrow on the SC Magazine website. So we've got two more auditing and compliance sessions on the way for you, so we hope you will continue to hang with us. So thanks again, Michael, and thanks, everybody. Thanks, Greg.